do, Father, and it's always right. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. The Open With the Question has absolutely nothing to do um, with the message whatsoever, but it's hopefully a moment of, I don't know what it would be a moment of. <laughs> how many of you, maybe it's Hannah, um, how many of you have ever come to church and you just go to church because it's just what you do? <laughs> You, you don't really feel like being in church. It's not really the day that you feel like worshiping. It's just tradition or your mom made you come or maybe there's lots and lots of reasons, um, but it's just not something that you're feeling. Anybody ever guilty of that? Yeah. How many of you feeling that today? Let me start. I will. Today's a rough day for no reason whatsoever. Maybe it's because Olivia's gone. This is just one of those days that I just don't feel like, whatever, churchy. It doesn't feel like a worshipful day. So two things I want to do. One, that happens. But God is to be worshipped and praised anyway. And so we worship and praise him because he's good. And two, I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with feeling that way. That we pray through that. So I want to open again with prayer. I know we prayed and then Joe prayed, but I want to pray because if you're just here listening to a guy who's pretending who's just here because he's earning a paycheck, you might as well pack up and leave now. Um, so let's pray again if we can. Father, I confess to you this morning that whatever it is, I'm not feeling it. I'm not. I'm not tired. I slept great. <laughs> there is no prevailing sin that I need to deal with right now. I miss my wife. She's been gone for a total of 12 hours. <laughs> but God, I just don't feel it this morning. And so Father, I pray, God, you tell us that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so Father, we praise you. We praise you because you're good. You are holy and just. You are righteous. You are forgiving. You are loving. You are kind. You are patient. You are still on the move. So, Father, whether we feel it or not right now or at all today, it is true. You are Lord. You are good. And so, Father, I pray that you would overshadow me like you have so many people throughout history. I pray that you would overshadow every person in this room, every person that may hear this message on video. I pray that you would overshadow all of us. And revival would start right now. God, you said that your word does not return to you void, and you did not send your Holy Spirit to just live in sleepy, cumbersome people. And so revive me this morning. Revive us, O Lord, that we might see you again. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, go ahead and turn in the Bible to the very first words of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. So as I've been praying over the past few weeks, um, as we finished up the letters of Peter, Asking God, what is it that you want us to go through next? What's next, God? And we've got a few weeks left in this year, which is crazy to think about. Uh, just about three and a half, four months left. Uh, about three months left of preaching. God, what do you want to look at next? And so one of my favorite books in the Bible, and has always been one of my favorite books, and God has been kind of drawing me back to this book multiple times this year, is the book of Genesis. So many great statements about the book of Genesis. And so today, we're going to look at the stories of Genesis. And this is what we're going to do for the never, next several weeks, is looking at the major stories of Genesis. And no, we're not going to preach through every single word like we did in First and Second Peter, or we'd be here until uh, who knows when. And so but we're going to preach through the major stories in the book of Genesis. I want to open with a quote this morning by Ken Ham. Ken Ham is the founder and director of the Answers in Genesis organization. If you've ever heard about uh, the big ark that's in Kentucky or the Creation Museum, which are awesome, you should go see them, by the way. Um, he is the one that came up with that idea, had those things built, oversees those. They're incredible experiences, things to go through. Ken Ham, who is this just genius when it comes to the scripture, said this. He said, every single biblical doctrine of theology directly or indirectly, ultimately has its basis in the book of Genesis. Everything we know about God, everything we should believe about God, everything that, that we need to know about God starts in the book of Genesis. I added to it, and I said this, a good understanding and a deep study of the book of Genesis is necessary, necessary, crucial, life-altering for every single person that declares that they are a Christ follower. 
You cannot understand the rest of Scripture without spending deep time in the study of Genesis. Jesus quoted the book of Genesis so much. Everything we know about God has its Genesis in Genesis. And so today, looking at the stories of Genesis, we're going to look at the story of creation, stopping right before Adam and Eve, because that's the second major story. And so today, just the story is the story of creation. So looking at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 25, and we need to say this before we go. You will have more questions than answers when we get through with this. There will be some answers given, I hope. But we will have more questions than answers as we go through this. Yes, there will be theories and ideas. And I'll be very clear when I say this isn't necessarily something that is, is, is laid out and is crystal clear. But this is the direction that I go. Some of those I may disagree with Pastor Dave on or you may disagree with me. But that's the beauty of the book. Unless it tells us exactly what it is, it's okay for us to say, like, I could be wrong, but I believe this. We'll have some of those encounters as we go through. But there are some things that are very, very, very clear. And that's what we're going to look at, make those things come out and jump off the page. But you'll have more questions than answers. How do we handle those questions that we come about? Well, the first thing that we do is we pray. We have to be a praying people. The Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God. God will punish him for asking, but will give it to him liberally. And so if you have questions that you won't answer, don't run to a book, don't run to the internet, don't send me a text message yet, don't call Pastor Dave, don't go to anybody else, pray. God, do you want me to know this answer? And God may give you the answer in instant revelation. You may say, yes, boom. But probably not. Probably not. God may tell you, hey, I've given you the answers already. Dig deep. Go in. God calls us in his word, a people of the word. And so the first thing is to pray, and the second thing is to dig deep into the Bible. Dig deep into the Bible. The next thing is to go to those faithful scholars and preachers who've walked before us. I don't mean me. I don't mean me. I'm 39 years old. I'll be 40 in a month from now. Yuck. <laughs> but I don't mean me. I've been walking. I've been a Christian for 17 years. This is my first time to be a senior pastor. I just graduated seminary about 14 years ago. I don't mean me. I mean those men who've walked through the Bible for decades, who've dealt with it faithfully for decades. I mean Pastor Dave. I mean others who've opened up the Word. I mean those, those preachers that you see on TV, those ones who've written the commentaries and the books, who stayed and they've lived and they've dwelled in the island of the Scriptures. Go back to them. Look at them. One of my favorites in speaking about the book of Genesis is a guy named Kent Hughes. That is a name that you may want to know. His first initial is R. R. Kent Hughes absolute man of God and has laid out, has filleted the book of Genesis. Great teacher. Go to those faithful scholars and, pre and preachers. Also ask questions. We are so embarrassed in the church to ask questions. And sadly, we've passed this over to our students. I work with students a lot. I have for years now. When I sit with students now, I say, hey, any questions you've got? And they just look at you like you're dumbfounded. And I don't think it's that they don't have questions because I have kids too. They never stop asking questions. Can I drive? Can I go out? Can I have some money? Can I do this? Oh, can I do that? My little girl walked down this morning with makeup all over her face. And I said, Madeline, what's on your face? Don't tell her I said this. Please. I said, Madeline, what's on your face? She said, I put on some makeup. I said, yeah, but I, I don't think this that goes here is supposed to be down here. And she said, how do I do it? I said, I don't know. Mommy's on an airplane. <laughs> kids ask questions, but we train them to not ask questions in the context of the Bible and in the church because we think the church is somewhere for you to come and sit quiet. And that's not true. It's not true. Plug into Bible studies and ask questions. Ask questions here. This is, this is my permission and my begging of if I say something that does not make sense or it is not clear, don't just start screaming at me, but raise your hand. Praise God that we're in a small congregation to where you wouldn't disrupt things so much where if you just said like, hey, that wasn't very clear. Or, or I didn't hear that. Or is this what you said? That won't throw me off. And if it does, that's okay. Throw me off. Have fun. Try. <laughs> Ask questions. Let's be okay with asking questions again, but then also being settled with the fact that maybe our questions might not be answered. This past week, I went to lunch with a new friend, and we were talking about things in the Bible and asking questions of one another, and we finally came to this answer. There are just some things we're never going to know. You know, we like to say things like, when we get to heaven, we'll know everything. It's not true. That would make you God. 
that would make you a good Mormon because they believe that they're going to be gods on their own little planets and they're going to have answers to everything, but that's not what the scripture teaches us. There is one God, and he's not you and he's not me. We won't know everything, so ask questions, but rest in the fact that you might not know. Pray, read the word, seek out those scholars who've walked before us, ask questions, and be willing to not get answers. Story of creation, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. Yes, I'm going to read it. Is how powerful are these words? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse, separate the water from the expanse for the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. There was evening, there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water team of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teams according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the water and the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. There was evening, there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Oh boy. We're not even in the picture yet, and we're supposed to figure out what it is you want us to see. And so, Lord, I pray again in full dependence the words that you taught us to pray. Open our eyes that we might behold great wondrous things from your scripture. God, help us know you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis. The beginning of everything is in Genesis. Literally, the words here mean in the beginning. The book of Genesis teaches us everything about God that we need to know. And this first chapter is dedicated not to creation. It's dedicated to teaching us about God. God is the subject of the whole Bible, but specifically Genesis chapter 1. And so we're going to see things this morning that are about God as we look at the story of creation. And the very first thing that we see is that because of God and by God and the system that God has established, faith is required. From the very get-go, and if you're honest with yourself, when you read the creation story, you'll see this in thinking like, man, faith is absolutely required to believe this stuff that I have just read. This is not reading about 9-11 that you guys saw the smoke over the hill. This is not reading about World War II or Vietnam that some of you served in or had relatives. This is not reading about stuff that, that we're just out of distance or putting our hands on or we have physical pictures of. 
This is about reading about creation. When there was nothing, now there's all this. Faith is required. God is a God who requires faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't please God with your works. You can't please God with your pretty. You can't please God with how sweet you are. You can't please God with your attendance or your tithe or any of those things. You can't even please God by your obedience. We're obedient because we are his disciples. We please God by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And what is the first thing that requires faith? And it's just the fact that there is a God. In the beginning, God. There is one. There is one. No, you have not seen him. You have not embraced him. You may have felt his presence, and you have, most of you. There is a God. Psalm 53, 1 says this, the fool. And Jesus doesn't take that word lightly. We do. We throw it around flippantly. Jesus said, don't call anyone fool. He used the word raka. But God says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. But there is. So the first thing that requires faith is that God is. There is a God. And so we believe first that God is in existence. He is, always has been. And then we see some things about God as we walk through these very first words here. Not only is God, God is, but he is as he's described himself. He is as he's explained himself. And you remember back in English, if you go back to school, sorry to do this to you guys, you either just finished it or you're in it right now. The whole subject-verb agreement thing. Remember how annoying that is walking through that? We got those English nerds that love that stuff. Sorry to offend you. But we, we, so we've got those people. I didn't even mean to do that, but I saw your face. We've got those people that love that kind of stuff. I'm a math nerd, so I can call you an English nerd. So we've we got people that really love that subject-verb agreement stuff. And then we got others of us that just don't care. And, and we win. There's a vast majority of us that don't care at all. We don't even know what sub subject and verb are. We just know I talk. I just talk fast or I talk slow. You guys are off in Jersey, so you all talk fast. <laughs> and so we, we talk in a certain way. We don't worry if this word matches this word or if you can pinpoint this back there so if you can diagram a sentence. But we see here the Hebrews were very, very interested in subject verb agreement. Very interested in it. Because there was something deeper that meant there. And we see that not only is God, but God is a certain way in the way that he describes himself. And we see this in subject verb agreement here. The subject here is God. The verb here is created, but they don't agree. For one of the very few times in Scripture, we don't see subject-verb agreement here because we see different tenses. We see that God here, the word used for the subject here, is in plural form. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But the Bible says there's only one God. As a matter of fact, God says that those aren't false gods, those other things out there, that they're not gods, that there is only one God. So why in the world would God say, use the word here as he spoke this to Moses, to the Holy Spirit? Why would it be in plural form? Because he's pointing something out. And then we see the disagreement. Created. Created, though, is in singular format. It's a singular verb. And you don't see this in your English unless you've done deep, deep study. But we see God plural here, as if there's more than one, but we know there's not because the Bible says there's not. But we see created as singular, and singular just means an action done by one person. An action done by one. No one else has contributed. It's been done by one. Almost as if in the very first five words of Scripture, six words of Scripture, God has said that there's more but one. Trinity. The Trinity, the thing that we can't explain, God says, even though you don't understand it. And I'm not going to give you all the lame things we've used to try to explain the Trinity. Because this is God's thing, though. God says, I am three, but I am one. There is one God, three persons. And there always has been. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the one who created. But he's divided into three. Can I explain that? No. But faith is required that I believe that God is. And God is as he's told us right here. Three, but one. He also goes on to tell us more of how he is. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God, obviously, if he's there in the beginning, what does that mean about him? He was before the beginning. Now our minds explode at that point because we think, how, how can you be before the beginning? If the beginning is the beginning, nothing can be before that. You know what? We are limited in that way. But God is limitless. God is not bound by time. 
God is not bound by place. God is not bound by any rule or anything in the world. He's limitless. In the beginning and before the beginning was God because God was the beginning of all things. I know it doesn't make sense. But we have faith that God is how he described. So he is. He is the Trinity. He is the three in one. He's also limitless. He's before the beginning. He's, he, the, there is no end. God has always been. He always will be. And he's also the creator God. God the creator. And it says here he created the heavens and the earth. And Hebrews 11.3 says that everything we see, God created out of nothing. He said he took nothing and he created into everything you see now. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. All things he created by the power of his word. He didn't even have to do it with his hands. He just said, let it be. And we'll see that in a few minutes. God is creator over all things. There's some beautiful things that we see in old languages that the Bible is written in. Latin is an old language when it comes to the Bible. And it said, this is the way we say it in Latin. Ex nihilo. Ex nihilo. Out of nothing. Beautiful language. God took nothing and made it into every single thing we see. He is creator of all out of nothing. Faith is required there. Faith is required there. And because he is creator over all things, because he is limitless, before he's before the beginning, because he's the one that said, let there be, because all these things are true, he is Lord over all. Please, please, let's stop saying, I made him Lord over my life. You didn't make him anything. I didn't make him anything. He said, let there be and there was. When you became a Christian, you just submitted to what has always been true. You didn't make Jesus Lord. You didn't make God the Father. You didn't make the Holy Spirit holy in your life. God has always been God. He is Lord over all creation. He is master and creator over heaven and earth and you and me. We didn't make him anything. He is Lord over all things. And he created all things. And it says here in verse 2, the earth was formless and void. Again, another beautiful thing that we see in Scripture, which is so powerful. And we see that as the Holy Spirit speaks to Moses, Moses does his best to explain exactly what formless and void means here. The Hebrews were poets. Their words were beautiful. Formless and void in Hebrew. Bohu wa bohu. So much cooler than formless and void. Bohu wa bohu. It's, you can feel it. It's deep. It's imposing. It's, it wraps you up. It's scary. It's frightening. I mean, it's, you feel it inside of you. Formless and void. And, and Moses here, and we see again here in English translation, we're limited by the words that we know. Formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And you're thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. There it is. There's the breakdown. God created everything out of nothing, but it says he's, he's hovering over waters. So, so obviously water was already there, right? No, this is a euphemism. We use these all the time. All the time. A euphemism, just using one word to describe another word or one statement to describe another statement to make it more lively. Sometimes we use it to, to use it in a profane way. Sometimes we take something that's a little hard to understand and we, and we say it in a different way. And this has always happened. We don't like to say this to our children. We don't like to say this, period, because it's, it's hard to realize it. It's hard to accept these things. The Bible says it this way. Every man is destined to die. Dying is a part of life. But we don't like to say people die. We don't even like to say the word die. So euphemisms that we used for it, they passed away. There's nothing wrong with saying that. It, is, it seems kinder. It's culturally relevant. It culturally works. And then we have those things when we don't really care about the person, or maybe we don't know about them, or we've used them in jokes before, or we've read them in comic books or other things, so now they kick the bucket. Taking something, making it harsh, or taking something harsh or heavy and making it light, they passed away. They moved on. They kicked the bucket. We know euphemisms. We use these all the time. And that's what, that's what God is leading Moses to do here, to just teach him somewhat of the understanding of saying, this is what I saw, Moses. I looked down and there was nothing there. Bohu wa bohu. It was formless and void. It was so deep. It was, it was incredible. I couldn't see the bottom of it. There's, there's just nothing. God in his place 
that he is in, and he sees darkness. I mean, nothing there. We don't understand the vastness and the emptiness that there was. And God just says, it's kind of like water, Moses. It's like looking into the deepness of waters. And you can see, and it's so clear, and it goes, and it goes, and it goes. And you may see some fish, and you may see some stuff, but then eventually it just goes dark. Just deep, formless, void. God says, that's what I formed everything out of. I didn't have anything to work with. There was nothing good. There was nothing bad. There was nothing there. And I formed it together. God forms things and makes things beautiful out of nothing of worth. This is our truth. God didn't look at you and see some incredible worth in you. God didn't look at me and be like, I can use that guy because that guy's got it all together. No. No. God saw a dead, unrepentant rebel who was running, trying to chase down his own dreams, his own aspirations, and be Lord over his own life. And God said, stop. I am the God who formed everything out of nothing. I am the master over all things. I created you for my purposes. And I'll form you into something different. Molding you and making you into a new creation. God is the one who takes nothing and makes every single thing. And then we get to where creation begins. God looks and it says all these different things. It's formless and void. Bohu, wa bohu. The darkness is over the surface of the earth. The Lord is looking over. There's nothing there. And then verse 3. And God said, and God said, let there be. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and their starry host by the breath of his mouth. God didn't have to reach down with his hand. God didn't have to stir it up in a pot. He just said, let there be. Let there be, and there was. Think about the power of his words. You want to know why we make prayer such a big thing among Christian people? One, because God tells us to. But two, because it's we can hear his voice. No, I don't mean audibly. I don't mean audibly. We can't hold God's audible voice. We got something bigger, his Holy Spirit. I mean, we throw, we throw his word around like just so flippantly. This is the word of God, the, the same words that said, let there be and there was. And you've got it in your own language. And most of the world doesn't. You want to break your own heart today? Just go home. Go home and look on YouTube or Google. And if you don't know what that is, meet me afterwards and I'll tell you what that is. Go home and Google or YouTube Chinese Christians getting the Bible. And they walk in and they, somebody hands them just a portion of the scriptures and they weep and they groan. And they lay on the floor and they sing praises because they've heard of this divine book, but they've never seen it. They've never seen it. It's been translated in their language. And ours just collect dust or hold other books or we serve them as coffee mug or coffee mug holders or other things. The word of God is so powerful. Let there be and there was. And this is what prayer is. God speak to me. God who can make things out of nothing. He said let there be and it says there was light. God said let there be light. There was light. And God saw the light was good. And then God made a distinguishing factor here. He separated things. He said the light would be called day. Why? Because that's what God said. And he said the night would be called, or darkness would be called night. So God separated. He said some things are light and some things are dark because I'm God and that's my prerogative. I could call some things light, some things darkness. People say it's so judgmental for you to say thought walking in the light, walking in the darkness. God did. We're God's followers and we proclaim God's truth. You're not judgmental. You're just a person of faith. God said the light I shall call day and the night I shall call darkness. He said the morning and the first day and it's over. Day one. Before you ask as we get there, there's lots and lots of theories of these 24-hour time periods. I don't know. I don't know. No, the sun is not here yet. No, we don't measure it according to the sun. Yes, I know there's theories. I don't know. And I think that's where I'm firm and comfortable in saying. So let there be light, and there was, and then God says else. He says again, God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. What? So there's water above and there's water below, and it took science thousands of years to figure this out if we just read the Bible. He says there's going to be an expanse in between the waters. It's going to separate the water above and the water below, and God said it's called sky. 
long before science even started doing experiments, God said, there's water above. And guess what? There's water above. Lots of it. And there's water below. Lots of it. And God says there's a separation between the two, and they're going to be called sky. It's going to be called sky, the separation in it, water. And he said the second day, and it was good. And God said, let the water under the sky be called together into one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. It was so. And he said, the dry ground separated apart, we'll call it land. And he said, the waters that are now collected, we'll call them seas. So that for the first time, we see God put limitation. He says, I'm going to put the ground over here and it will go no further. I limit you to where you are until I do something else. I, I limit the water to where it is until I do something else. Our God, as we learn about God, is a God of limitations. We hate that. We rebel against that. This is what the Tower of Babel was all about. People didn't want the limitations of just being humans. They wanted to be God. But our God is a God of limitations. Limitations are good. Limitations are good for our children. We've learned this by experience of being parents. And our kids hate it. They hate it. But one day when their parents will call us back and be like, you know what, you're right. And you know what's also true is our kids yearn for limitations. They need them. And I can say this as a kid who, who got limitations in some areas and also didn't get limitations in others. And yes, again, my parents are listening. But they would even tell you, we wish we'd had stronger ones. We wish we'd had stronger ones because limitations protect just giving your kids free will, reign to go all over the place is dangerous. God doesn't do that. He gives limitations. Our God who lays out these limitations, who formed and said, let there be dry land and let there be water collected into seas. They will go no further than anything else. And he says, it is good. It's good. We said early on, formless and void. And look at what God just did with his words. There was nothing there. And now God's formed it all. There's now land. There's now space. There's earth. There's waters. This once formless thing now has a form. And now he's going to fill it. He's going to fill it up. And he keeps going on. And he says this, and God said, verse 11, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, trees with fruits and seeds. Let the land produce vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds. It was evening, there was morning the third day. And we see here a God of order. A God of order. Think about this. What does it take for a plant to, to live? Some of you are teachers, and I can call you out if I need to. What does it take for a plant to live? Well, it has to have somewhere where its roots can do what? Hold on to, grow into land, or even the bottom of a sea. We do have aquatic plants as well. So there has to be a place where they can be. That's already been established before plants are called in. What else does there have to be for plants to survive? Water, already there, waiting for the plants. God puts everything in play before it's needed. What else does a plant need to survive? Light, it needs light, right? What is God? God has already created what? Let there be light. But here's something interesting. Our God is a God of order, but our God is beyond the science that we hold on to. I am not a science denier. Don't hear that. But real quick, we can walk through this. We can go back to first grade, and we can say, like, what does a plant need to live? It's why it's got green, green leaves that stick out, and inside those green leaves is something that makes them green. What's it called? Chlorophyll. Yeah, chlorophyll, which are filled with chloroplasts. And those take in the sun. And what do we call that whole system? photosynthesis and this this whole entire thing but there's been no sunlight yet you should listen man <laughs> photosynthesis there's no sunlight yet sun hasn't been created so yes god is a god of order but god is always just outside of science and so yes there are times when science does point and say like clearly there is a divine creator and his name is god and those times they got it right but there's other times when science try to explain it away. And they say there is no need. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And when science does that, science is wrong, always. And there are times when you cannot meld the two and you need to be okay with that. You need to be okay with that. 
God is a God of order, but he's also a God beyond science. He doesn't submit to our systems. Then it keeps on going. There was morning, there was evening, the third day. Verse 14, God said, let there be lights in this expanse called the sky to separate the day from the night. So listen to all the activity. They're going to separate the day from the night. They're going to serve as signs to mark the seasons, the days, and the years. Let them be lights. Let there be a great light that governs over the day and a lesser, night that gover lesser light that governs over the night. And so we see here again God who gives tasks. A God who gives jobs to other things that were formerly his job. Whose job in the beginning was it to say it's daytime? God. Now he said, let there be a created thing, the sun, to govern the day, to separate the day from the night. Before there ever was, God said there was a job to be done in the same way with us. God says the work of a believer is to do the works that he set out in advance for us to do. Meaning that before he ever created you, he already had work for you to do this year, this day, right now. It was already there. You'll walk in tomorrow, if you walk into tomorrow, with jobs mandated by God for you to do. God is a God who gives tasks. He said, it is the job of these lights that I'm putting in this expanse to separate the day from the night, to be markers to the seasons and all these different things, to sun to govern the day and the moon to govern the night. This was a job that God once had, but he says, now I'm going to let someone else do it. That doesn't make him any less Lord. He's fully in control of them. But he gives a task to another. We also see a God who plans, and I get a little bit sentimental and emotional about this, because if you ask me, when's the last time you really, 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 really cried? Yellowstone National Park. Over some stars. I tried to set it up. I just wanted to walk. I'd, I'd taken a, a sabbatical by myself out to Yellowstone, left my wife at home with three kids. Payback time. <laughs> <laughs> so I go out to Yellowstone, and I decide I'm going to wake up early because I want to be at Old Faithful when the sun rises. How cool would that be? And there's snow on the ground, and it's still cold outside. It was early October, and I'm thinking, like, man, I've heard this thing. When it explodes, it falls down like a frozen mist. I'm going to be there. But somehow, in my incredible intelligence, I messed up the time, and I got there about two hours early. And so I'm rolling into Yellowstone, and I mean, it is dark, guys. I mean, dark. But the stars. So I get out of my car, and I'm like, man, what am I going to do now? And so I start just walking around. If you've ever been to Yellowstone, they've all got those little boardwalk paths that walk around Old Faithful. There's nobody there. What are they doing? It's two and a half hours before sunlight. Why aren't you at Old Faithful? I look up and I can hear this thing rumbling, but I can't see it. But what I can see is the stars in the sky. And the tears just ran down my face. Because I started to think, like, those are the stars that spoke to Abraham. And long before there was an Abraham, God had those stars because he's a God who plans. And he says, there's going to be a guy. He's going to need a big promise. He's going to need a big reminder. Boom. Let there be stars. Abraham, if you could count the stars, that's how many kids you'll have. Abraham, the sand of the shore that was here long before I created you, if you can count that, that's how many kids you'll have. As I walked under those stars that night, I thought, like, man, these are the stars for Abraham. And God said, oh, no, bro. These are the stars for you. He said, so many times in your life, you've wondered, do I see you? Do I know you? Do I feel you? Do I understand you? And he says, I put the stars in the sky and I call them by name. Not one of them is missing. I know them. I know you. God has a purpose for his creation. He has plans and he put the stars there for that. He gave him a job. He's a God who gives tasks. He's a God who plans. And then he keeps moving and now God creates life. Verse 20, all the way through, it says, God said, let the water teem, let it be abundant with living creatures. Let there be birds flying across the sky. And so God created the great creatures of the sky, God creatures of the sea, and the living things that moved across the waters according to their kinds. Every bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. All that he creates is good. Because people aren't here yet. It's all good. Creation is all good because people aren't here yet. And he says, everything according to its kind. It keeps on going. It says, God, bless them. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. So what do we see? Several things about God here. 
is that he is the God who creates life and he is intimate with all of creation. God could have just said, we need some stuff that breathes and moves, boom. But no. God said, man, I want the water to be full. So I'm going to take a specified moment to say, let there be things teeming, filling the waters, intimate time with the things in the oceans and the seas. Because he is intimate with his creation. He knows it. And then he's done with that. And then he says, oh yeah, the, the skies need to be filled with these, these beautiful animals that fly around. Birds! And he fills the sky with birds, various kinds. Intimate time that he's focusing just on those birds. And he says, now the water is full with these things that I know so clearly. And the, the sky is filled with these flying things that I know so clearly. He said, and now I'm going to focus on the land. And, it, and there needs to be animals according to their kinds that run around. And he knows them intimately because he spent time every stripe of the zebra. He said, how beautiful will it be with stripes? He said, I've done stripes. Now let me do dots. Cheetah. He said, I've done this. Let me spend more time on this. Intimate with all of creation diversity. We think diversity is something we came up with in our minds. Oh, we want more diverse schools. We want more diverse churches. We want more diverse neighborhoods. You know why that rings true in your heart? Because God is a diverse God. He is a diverse God. He created all these different things. The world is diverse. Why? So that we might take notice and worship Him who created all things well and different. And then you see this one statement that keeps on going here. Verse 24, it says it a lot. It keeps on going. It says it a whole lot. It says, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals according to their kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, livestock according to their kind, creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw all was good according to its kind. You hear that like 17 times in these 25 verses. Why? What does it mean? And it means, again, God is beyond science. Uh, Kent Hughes, I stole this from him. He says it means a fix of species, a fixity of species, meaning that things cannot change from one thing into another thing. A dog will never be a cat. A cat will never be a dog. A lizard will never be a monkey. A monkey will never be a man. Ever. Ever. It cannot happen. It did not happen. People laugh at people of faith who say they believe this, but you believe that dust can spin around in space even though there's no sun and sun creates gravity and then all of a sudden that dust can hit something else but there's nothing else and then they blow up and become stars and apparently in those stars there's proteins and then those proteins come together and then you get monkeys and men. But they laugh at us for having faith in this. You want to talk about faith? You believe that mess. That's why Stephen Hawking, who's known as the most brilliant man ever, came back later and said, whoa, 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 that Big Bang idea was pretty stupid of us to come up with because that really sounds like faith. Monkeys can never become men. Dogs can never become cats. Cats can never become dogs. Things are what they are because God has set a fixity of species according to their kinds. There's a radical difference between adaptation and evolution. And science is doing everything it can to blend those definitions. They blend the definitions, but they don't blend. Lord is, he is Lord over all that lives, formless and void. Bohu wa bohu. Not anymore. What was once formless has now been formed. What was now empty has now been filled as if something bigger is about to happen. The earth is ready for something bigger to take place. And then we ask, did God do all this? We'll get to that bigger next week. But why did God do all this? What was, what was going on in his mind? Why did he do this? So I want to let him answer for himself. I'm an older brother, and I learned this from my younger brother. He used to get called Little Brock. Brock's little brother. Oh, you're little son. You're just like your brother. Any younger siblings who dealt with this? And the funny thing is later, when, when you get out of high school or college and then you go back to your hometown, what happens then? Oh, you're Jake's big brother. Oh, you're, oh, you're, you're, you're just like Jake, or you act like Jake, or, or, or you like music like Jake. But what do you mean I like music like Jake? I like that music way before Jake ever liked it, and we get offended. But I learned this from my little brother. He just asked me to speak for myself. 
I just want to describe myself. I just want to tell what my passions are. I don't want to be little Brock. I don't want to be little son. I don't want to be Brock's little brother or Brock's little baby brother or even look like Brock or sound like Brock. I just want to be Jake. So I learned this from him. And so let's let God speak for himself. Why did he do it? Psalm 115.3. Our God is in heaven and he does whatever he wants. God did it because he wanted to. And he is God and that is his prerogative. He does what he wants to. He cannot be manipulated or moved. He is not like man and he does not change. God does what he wants. Always. He's God. God did it because he wanted to. Next, he did it because it pleased him. And the word is delighted. He delighted in this. Psalm 135, 6, the Lord does whatever pleases him. In the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. Why did God kill his son? The prophet Isaiah, through the Holy Spirit, says it pleased the Lord to crush him. He does what he wants. And he did it because it pleased him. And it still pleases him. Oh, God did this all for me. He did this all for me. Remember we've joked about this song before, back in the day, by I won't say the artist's name that wrote it, but we're never going to sing it here, please. He thought of me above all. What heresy. He didn't think of you above all. Colossians 1.16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. God did it all for himself. All for him. He didn't think of you above all. He thought of him above all. He's God. If he thinks of you above himself, you are now God. How scary does that seem? God thinks of himself above all things. He did it because he wanted to. He did it because it brought him pleasure and delight. He did it because he thought of himself. And he also did it to multiply the praises that he deserved that were going to come to him. Listen to this. Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. He knew that the stars would never stop singing his praises. He knew that the rocks would cry out about his majesty. He knew that the sun and moon would never stop singing his praises. What are the birds talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ. What are the deer when they make noises in the woods behind you on Salmon Lane? What are they saying? They're singing about the glory of God because that's all they know. That is their song. God created all of it so that his majesty might be proclaimed and multiplied. So that his praises might go forward. Revelation 5.13. When we finally get a picture of what things are supposed to look like. What they're going to return to. The apostle John looks and, and he gets this vision of, of what things look like in heaven. Chapter 5.13. He says, and then I heard every creature in heaven. And on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb be praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. Amen. Why did God do it? To get the praise that he deserved and to multiply the praises that he deserves. And why else did God do it? Because he had something else in mind. Something bigger is about to come. He's about to create one more thing, and this gets real intimate with me and you, and we'll look at it next week, but he knows something before he ever created us. Because we are rebellious people. We're rebellious people. Moses is getting this message from the Holy Spirit as he walks in the desert. He's, he's writing this down on papyri, and God is sustaining this so that we can read this today. And he's just left the land that's full of false gods and false ideas and lying sciences and false theories and all these other things. And he knows that we as rebellious people are going to buy into it. And we're going to say things like, is my job my God? Because that's what I devote my allegiance to. Are my children my God? Or is my stuff my God? Is, is, is Allah the God? Or is this God? Or is that God? Or how many gods are there? He knew that we would be a rebellious people. And he had this message already. And he would pin it out through the pen of Isaiah later. Isaiah verse 40, 26. He says, lift up your eyes and just look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry host one by one, calls forth each of them by their name, and because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Just look up and see. Go outside tonight and look at the stars. God has required faith. And he's given us everything to draw us to that faith. In the beginning, was God. God still is. He has always been. He always will be. And he will be exactly as he's always been. He is Lord.
fully in control. And he's all that can help us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Whew. You are. I want to say you're big, but you're not big. You're God. Big is a word that helps me out. You are God. You are God alone. You are Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You are in charge, and we submit to you. And God, if someone here in this room stands against you and doesn't submit to you, I pray that tonight you would draw them outside and draw their eyes to the stars. I pray that today they would hear the echo of the birds singing. And even for those of us who've submitted to you and have declared that Jesus is Lord and have been born again, I pray that we would never hear the songs of the birds the same. I pray that when the winds go by, we would know that's from the Lord. I pray that when we see the shore and we see the oceans and we see the water gathered, gathered together, the clouds going across the sky, you are God. And you've always been. We praise you. We worship you. Teach us more about you. We might sing your praises with the rocks, with the trees, with the animals. And I thank you for the opportunity to do that now. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The last song we're going to sing today is Glory to His Name. The words are in your bulletin.